Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and thanks for dropping in. And today you're in for a treat, and I'm super excited to hear um, from our guests today. Um, In this episode, we are going to kind of go down another exploration, friends, on some of these places that entrepreneurship can lead us from flowers to flowers, um, how it grows, um, the journey. And then there's that nasty word, pivoting our businesses, which we've heard so much in the last couple of years. So, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I hear, when I used to hear the word entrepreneurship, the things that would pop into my mind would be things like out of my reach or a person would jump into my mind, someone who I would feel like I could never achieve that. And I always thought I could just, I could never ever do that. And I just wanna say friends, the whole purpose of these talks that I'm having with these different entrepreneurs is to show you that we are people just like you. We never thought that we would be where we are today, 10 years ago, am I right guys? That's you right. Are right. <laughs> <laughs> so, friends, I am honored today to have the dynamic couple, Daniel Shavy and Wesley Turner, who are um, business partners in crime. I mean, to tell you, you guys, when I went to like stalk you a little bit online, is it three biz- Is it three separate businesses? It's actually four, four separate businesses. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So there's one I don't even know about. Yeah. <laughs> so. I am going to, so I'm just going to kind of give the rundown and then we're going to start letting you guys fill in all the gaps for. So Daniel, as many of you of my listeners will know who you are, Daniel, um, are uh, the flower farmer and the brains behind Petal Pickers, which is a flower farm located in South Carolina. And he now ships his gorgeous stems nationwide. um, And y'all, if you don't watch his stories and his reels, Um, I mean, it's like walking into fairyland, right? I mean, it's like a fairy tale. It is just so very, very beautiful. And then Wesley has the Nested Fig, which I believe is a warehouse shopping show business. And I think that did that grow out of your local garden boutique shop called Roots? Yeah, well, it actually grew out of our furniture and home decor store four rooms, but that was one of the big pivots. Oh, my goodness. So, friends, y'all are in for a treat because I will tell you from watching these, the lives and the reels and the stories, um, which are I look forward to every day. Um, there's just so much beauty and flowers involved. So um, I just hope and, and I know that we're going to learn something from you guys. So first, and y'all decide who can go first. Um Tell us kind of how all this got started. What festered this all up? All right. Well, let's start with Wes telling a quick story um, because he's the real entrepreneur between the two of us. (laughs) I have learned a lot um, of what I know about growing my business and here at the farm um, from Wesley. But I'll start it off with when Wes was about 10 years old, he went to his mom and told her he wanted to buy a Coke vending machine for his garage. I, yeah, actually, I was gifted a Coke <laughs> vending machine. I'm a, I've been an entrepreneur. It actually goes back a little bit before that. Really quickly, what I used to do, I have two older brothers, and what I used to do is when I was little and we would go trick-or-treating, I would come back and I would take out the candy that I wanted to keep, and then I would put the other candy that I didn't really like that much in a bag, I would keep it hidden away for a couple of weeks. And then when their Halloween candy was gone, I would start selling it to them. (laughs) I would make them pay me for the candy. You still do that with our snacks here. (laughs) Basically. Um, And so then, like Daniel mentioned, when I um, was about nine or 10, I was gifted. I don't even know how, but a Coke machine. Someone was going to throw it away and they said it worked. And I was like, I want that. So they gave it to me. And so then I put that on our back um, porch deck area so that now the neighborhood 
friends, my brothers, everyone who came over had to buy their coats from, from me. So I used to sit down every Sunday, you know, when the paper came out and all the deals were in the paper, I would sit down, I would go through who had the cases of Coke products <laughs> or whatever on sale that week. You know, back then they would say like limit two cases here and limit two cases there because you could, and I would figure out where I could get the best prices and I would make my mom drive me around <laughs> to the different grocery stores to get the Cokes. <laughs> and we so had, that's, <laughs> that's how we started our businesses using the same concepts. <laughs> yes, basically. Yeah. You know, what a generous mother you must have had. A, she let you put that machine on her back porch. Right. And then she drove you around. I mean, I think your mom gets the star for sure. Right. Yes. My mom has definitely always been supportive in whatever business endeavor sort of thing. She's like, yeah, why not? And so after that, it kind of went on. I fell in love with retail. My grandmother had a Meryl Norman cosmetic studio makeup. Yep. Um, and she was adding or had like a gift area in there as well. So for whatever reason, I guess they had conferences for the Meryl Norman brand. And so one time right out of, I think it was my senior year in high school, right before college, um, my mom and I went with her because it was in Atlanta. We we're like, that'd be a fun trip just for a weekend. And um, part of that included going to the Atlanta market. And when I walked in and I saw that you could buy all of these items at wholesale and resell them to people, I had died and gone to heaven. So I was <laughs> like, this is my place. This is my place to be. <laughs> it's truly an experience going to market. And I've been going now with Wes for like 10 years and you can buy almost anything home decor, gift or related. And um, that's, you know, with that knowledge is how we started our first business. So, yeah. And, and so, so tell me the, how that happened. I mean, what was the first business and how did it kind of roll into this? I mean, from those of us, I will tell you, I have such an appreciation now. People say things to me about the people that are looking from the outside at what I do or what you do. It looks so dreamy and wonderful. And it is, I'm not right. saying it's not, but we know that there is like a spider web behind right. the scenes, right? Um, so I just wanna say what you guys are doing is, um, it's really inspiring. It's really inspiring to me and um, I appreciate it so much. So tell us how that kind of all rolled out. Well, let's set the scene. So when, I guess you were in, you had just graduated high school and then you start, Wesley started um, a small garden boutique in his hometown and read, ran that for a little bit. He went to Mississippi State um, for horticulture, funny enough. Um, and while he was there, he started another small business in the town um, in Mississippi and ran that. And so he moved around, graduated college, ended up in Greenville, and then... Um, you were working at a garden center yeah. here in Greenville. I was the manager of a local garden center here, but I always knew like, uh, I want to have my own place or whatever sort of thing, my own store, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just from doing all of that. So then we met yep. in um, 2000, 2009 or eight. We met in 2008, mm -hmm. um, which as everyone can remember, if you were old enough, that was the worst time for businesses. And oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just graduated. I had just graduated college. Um, so I'm a few years younger than Wes. And it was hard to find a job in 2008 with my degree. I also didn't really have a clear direction on where I wanted to go. And so I was working um, a job at a clothing store. And then Wes was working... Um, at the garden center while we were dating and Wes was like I think I'm ready to start my own business or you know do you want to help and I was like yeah let me get out of this place and let's go let's do this together I just felt uh, really inspired by his um, drive and passion um, I could right when I met him I knew there was something different about Wesley that really intrigued me and I was really attracted to your drive, I guess, from the first time we met. I think that I agree with you, Daniel. And 
I can feel that um, that inspiration of it's like, golly day, he makes it so easy. I totally get what people say to me now. Do you know what I mean? It's like you make it look so easy, Lisa. And I'm like, it is not easy. Right. But because we love it, Wes, that's what it is. It's just like it's in our it's in our blood. It's in our right. veins to to do. I mean, it's not even so much selling as it is making people happy, helping people. And just, yeah, so I totally get it, Daniel. I agree. I got you too, Wes. <laughs> Thank you. So that's when we decided to open Roots, which is our original of our adult stores now, the four businesses, <laughs> Roots. Um, and we were in the situation, I was managing a garden center and I was, I think I was like 28 or whatever. And I was like, I'm getting ready to, I want to do my own thing. Doesn't matter how old you are. If you are 70 and you want to start a business, do it, go for it. But yeah. we were, he, we weren't settled in. So I was like, we really were, you know, we hadn't climbed any ladders. We hadn't started making large income or anything like that. So it felt right for us at the time because we didn't, if it failed, we weren't falling very far. <laughs> we, yeah. we, you know what I'm saying? So we um, decided to um, open roots. And I will say, um, you know, when the economy is down, that's also a very good time to start a business because the ride up is a lot, um, a lot easier. And we found, you know, I was 28. Looking back, I'm like, who rented us retail space? I was 28. I was 23. 23. And they, we signed, we had all the power in our court. So we negotiated down to a one-year lease because if it didn't work, then we needed to get out and we had right. no money to continue it. But um, And in commercial real estate, a one-year lease is like. It's unheard, unheard of. Like, yeah, will not do like today. You could not go find a one year lease anywhere. Yeah. Um, and but you know, they were willing to do that just to have the space filled and then even go into market like with vendors. You know, usually there's large minimums or buy ins or whatever, they just wanted business as well. So, us being broke, <laughs> um, we were able to talk to vendors and they would sell us what we wanted. So we were able to buy, you know, smaller quantities from a wider variety of vendors to have our offerings. But also we lived, um, we live two hours from Atlanta where the big market is for this type of thing. And we would drive there like every week before our store opened and we would walk all the floors and look for samples, you know, when they're trading out, we, like we would run. <laughs> yeah, we would run because it's like 20 floors and we're like, OK, we got two hours to get through these floors. And we would just make our rounds every week, picking up sample items. They were discounted. So Bargains. Were discounted yeah. wholesale. So we were making a lot of money off of those items. Yeah. So we were able to mark those up and make a lot of money, you know, a higher margin on those. Yeah. Um, items. So that's where we started. And we really marketed the business because it was a down economy off of doing potted arrangements. Um, so we focused on house plants and then potted arrangements, orchids, that sort of thing. And we marketed it as if you've been used to having cut flowers, well, now you can get a potted arrangement. And even if you do not know how to take care of a house plant, it's going to last you way longer than a cut flower. Right. right. So Good that, point. That's how we started our business. And our slogan was, our arrangements have roots. And our business name was Roots. Yeah. Oh. And, um, and I do just want to point out, like, we started with nothing. And in fact, we, Wes's grandmother um, reached out and said, I know you're starting this business. I will go ahead and give you a $10,000 like, this is what I would give you after I pass. So if you want it now to help start your business. So we uh -huh. had $10,000. And then I think your mom yeah, contributed. kind of contributed to that as well. But so that we is where we started. Like $20,000. <laughs> so so y'all bootstrapped. Y'all bootstrapped. Right. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we started out, and to those who are starting and you're in that um, kind of element, the thing that you have to do is you have to step outside of your body and picture the business that you want. You can't focus on the emotions 
that you feel or where you are in that place in time. You feel broke. You feel like, how's this going to work? But you can't present it in that way. You have to present it or view it how the customer is going to walk in. So you want to, you know, present yourself in that manner. Um, Almost like fake it till you make it. Yes. And by always just presenting yourself bigger than you actually are, it's going to keep you like out of your comfort zone. Right. Um, because if you're comfortable in your business, then you're not growing your business. And you just always, you're, we to this day still feel like, oh, do we have everything in place? Or is this the right decision that we're making? And when you're planning ahead, it still feels cloudy. Um, and every, you know, things fall into place and you, you make good decisions, but that uncomfortable feeling has never gone away as we continue to grow our businesses. You know what, Daniel, it's so funny you should say that. You know what I just wrote down when Wes was talking a minute ago? That you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. To be an entrepreneur and being, I heard somebody say this the other day, I had dinner as a matter of fact with two of Steve's cousins, couples, and they are incredibly um, successful entrepreneurs and other air, I mean, just huge successful business people. And it just humbled my heart to sit at that dinner table and they feel exactly the same way we do. Right. You know what I mean? They are, their businesses are in the bees and you know what I mean? It's like, they're still facing that quivery feeling inside. Like yeah. you get at market probably buying tons of stuff. Right, and right. Daniel, when he's ordering 5 million bulbs in or what, you know, what ridiculous number he has to order now. Um, so I told, I, it's, I think that we could say that over and over and over again, it's being uncomfortable. You have to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. That's Absolutely. the way it is. You know, isn't it kind of like loving somebody, man, you got to lay it all out there. And if you're not, well, my dad used to say, golly, girl, you keep stretching your neck across that chopping block. And it's like, I kind of like it, you know? I mean, that's kind of what makes us what we are. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah, and that definitely, I think that is one thing, a tip in growing your business is you got to be un uncomfortable because if you're comfortable, then you are not growing. And then also it even goes to your inventory, whether like for me, that could be furniture, home decor, it could be indoor plants for Daniel, that can be like you said, bulbs or seeds or whatever. One of the things that I've, you know, looked back and it sometimes hindered my own business was not, you know, uh, stepping out and buying increasing my inventory numbers yes. because I was like, Oh no. Like we used to say, okay, January is going to be slow. It's after the holidays. January is going to be a slow month. And we would let our retail stores, the inventory get really, really low mm -hmm. um, because, Oh, we're not going to really have those people anyway, whatever. By accident in the last couple of years, we have gone into January with really high inventory, basically beating the supply chain. We, like over the right. last couple of years, we we ordered like way out so that we wouldn't get caught with the supply chain issues. That made our Januaries have very high inventory and we had incredibly high sales in those months. So, there you, go. you know, it's one of those things Again, that goes back to being uncomfortable. You got to push that envelope, that one step, that one, order a few more seeds, order a few more bulbs than you think you would have or whatever. Because if you don't have it, you can't sell it. And that's happened too from us, you know, taking a few stumbles along the way and, you know, getting caught with um, no furniture on the sales floor or no large pieces of furniture in our furniture store or running out of a certain plant that is a staple plant or, you know, it'd be like a, a florist running out of greenery for the week when they're trying to get all their arrangements done. It's happened to us almost every situation we've gotten through yeah. and stumbled through, but you just can't focus on that fear of failing. Um, you really just have to kind of set yourself up for success and, and kind of focus on what it's going to take to succeed. 
you know, it's so funny you should say that, that it would be like me running out of soil blockers, right. which has happened. Right. And we have the largest order of soil blockers, you know, on a slow ship from England right now. Um, I mean, it's so many, I lay in bed at night and think, oh my gosh, do you think we'll sell them all? Right. You know I mean? It's like, I quit. I know we will, Right. but it's those little creepy question marks that climb around on you when you get that doubt. Right. right. Um, and then, I mean, I'm just so you're, and you guys, I'm sure are the same way. I'm just so grateful. I'll mention it at the breakfast table and Steve will say, so if you don't sell them, we'll figure it out. Don't worry right. about it. Right. You know, right. I mean, exactly. what's the worst. All right. So you got roots. Yep. So that started in 2009. So we started roots. We did, um, the plants, indoor plants. Right. Um, we didn't start with cut flowers at the time. That came later. Um, but we would mix in a little bit of home decor, some gifty items, some lamps, that sort of thing in there. So as the business grew for roots and the plants, people were also wanting more of that home decor sort of thing. And we were in a smaller shop. So in 2013, I was like, let's open a second store. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. By so the way. Yeah. So that's when we opened four rooms, which is our furniture and home decor store. And we, you know, you opened that up in a smaller building, a smaller space. Oh, and yeah. What, how long were you in that space with the furniture store? Just one year? One, like one, one and a half years. Indeed. And in one and a half years, that business took off so much, we had to move it into a larger space. So not only did we open a new store, but then we had to redo the entire thing by opening a larger store shortly wow. after that and we've actually done that with roots as well we had as the business grew we had to expand into the space next door to us when it came available um and we had to redo everything then too so <laughs> yeah we're good at moving and redoing businesses, but we started out small with what we could do. You outgrow it, but then don't be afraid to move if that's what you need to do. And that's what it's made. I mean, that's the point, right? right? To keep fluid. I mean, we bought a warehouse and within six months, we, for our fulfillment center, within six months, I knew that we were going to outgrow it. It's like, oh my gosh. So then you buy something bigger and hope is that that you know two years later you'll say we need another one you know right. um yeah. but that so that is this path and so that is so totally awesome all right keep going this is so interesting so then we had the furniture home decor store and then in somewhere after that like 2019 you oh, okay well yeah um, so we decided to buy a farm. Wes grew up in the country he always loved animals he wanted some space and you know, we were in, our businesses are in a neighborhood community within our city. So it was getting to the point that every time we would go to the grocery store, out to dinner, and everyone wants to say, hey, or ask, they know us as the plant guys and the furniture people. So we're, you know, trying to eat dinner at grocery shop, and they're asking us about why did their fiddly fig die? And so we just wanted to get out of the city a little bit. Which we love our customers we and do. we appreciate. But, you know, we wanted that kind of like separation, not just from that, but from the businesses in general. Because when we lived there, we were just literally we like. basically lived in the stores. Yep. And we would go home to go sleep at night. So that's true. Like just to be able to have that separation of personal life and business. And it still never happens, but it's now a physical boundary. <laughs> until until the flower until farm. Until you started a flower farm. Until we started a flower farm and that, that went down the drain. But that was the thinking, like we'll be out, we'll have this separation because we lived just a few blocks from the store. So it was very easy to go home and then be like, I just need to go back and finish this one thing or whatever. So that's when we bought the farm in 2016. Yep, and so, we were actually, we, because we had our plant boutique and I dabbled in our backyard before we moved um, of growing sunflowers and vegetables and raised beds. And, and I started them from seed, funny enough. And about that um, time is when, I guess, well, we went to the beach in January on a quick vacation on our way back. We saw a sign for pick your own daffodils. It was a Sunday afternoon. We were literally driving home and we don't even do stuff like this normally, but we took a detour. It was fate. 
It was fake. It was. Um, <laughs> we took a detour and we're like, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so there was a daffodil farm you pick and there was grandmothers with their grandkids and couples. And we know, um, you know, like you picks on flower farms. And I just thought, this is great. We can totally do this at our farm. And this is amazing. And I went home, got on Instagram. I, I think the first thing I probably searched um, was on, it's, uh, we were on Instagram. Yeah, then. we were on Instagram. Um, so that was, yeah, in 2016. And the first thing I searched was you pick flower farms. And shortly after, just flower farms went into the deep hole on Instagram. And and it was, it like, was off and running. Oh there. my gosh, I can grow <laughs> every flower. Because <laughs> we were supposed to be doing what we were supposed to be doing was moving to the farm and we were going to grow some things for roots for like Christmas greens. So we were going to plant like Leland Cypress, holly. Magnolia, Holly, Winterberry, you know, the little bit lower, Hi. Hi. not full on flower farm. Then it went to, we saw the daffodil farm. Well, we could do that. We could have people come, you know, pick their own daffodils. And then he came back and started like finding, he found you. Yeah. Like I remember <laughs> like the first day found you on YouTube. Um, or Facebook. Or Facebook and then YouTube videos because I remember watching the videos, you know, um, we were still redoing our house and farm and everything. And it was like wildfire. And it just, <laughs> that's when the that's farm That's kind of how it happens, isn't it? When you do right. the flower farming thing, it is just so easy to fall head over heels into it, right? Right. So, so you started the farm in 16 or 17? 2016, we started the farm and Wesley started his Instagram account for, um, for our house renovations. So that's how Farm Shenanigans, our Instagram account came to be. And as we would get, you know, add a new farm animal here or there, we would talk about that and talk about your decor um, styling choices and everything as we were kind of redoing the house. And with the farm, I was that first year just grew for our retail stores. So I didn't sell to anybody else. It was just me harvesting flowers in the field and bringing the pickle buckets into our retail high-end <laughs> boutique retail store pickle buckets on the floor and customers went crazy and they just couldn't get enough and they kept buying them and buying them and that was the first time we really introduced um cut flowers to the retail store yeah we had still been plants up to that point and I guess my thinking was well, I know we don't sell cut flowers like a traditional florist and, and we always wanted to set ourselves apart. Um, that's really, I think, what's helped our businesses succeed. Yeah. But I felt like, well, these flowers are different than what you can buy anywhere. And I didn't even know there were other flower farmers in the area. I thought I was the only one that had come across Lisa, <laughs> <laughs> you know, growing all these flowers in Virginia. And um <laughs> Anyways, that's how y'all got on a TV show. What was that? Yeah, um, we got on, we bought the farm, which was on HGTV, which is sort of similar to like House Hunters, um, okay. but it's like a spinoff just for people buying farms. I don't think they do it anymore. I haven't seen any episodes. Yeah, recently. it was just a one episode show, but it was, it was an experience. They, they, came, did, yeah, they did. Yeah, they <laughs> did two seasons and we were just on one episode and they followed us around and um we had to pretend spoiler alert it's all fake but <laughs> yeah we had already been living in our house for six months but that was the stipulation yeah it had to be new a new purchase but then they showed us other farms that we would never think of buying but we had to pretend like there was a chance <laughs> so daniel um then the pandemic happened so tell me i know for i'm particularly, well, both of you, I know what happened in the flower business for that time period of before we all thought, what the heck are we going to do? Um, Wes, I can't imagine having a retail store full of stuff right? Um, that now all of a sudden nobody can come shop. So tell me about that. Yeah. So of course, you know, everyone dreaded that. And that's the moment when you're like, okay, this is the situation. How am I going to handle it? Because you just automatically have to start how am I going to chew this and handle this? And it wasn't just that the stores closed. Well, we, I had high tunnels full of ranunculus and, 
anemones and all the good stuff that my most expensive crops that year. Um, but also, you know, we have about 30 employees between all the businesses and then all of a sudden they don't, they aren't going to come to work. And yeah. right. you know, Ugh, makes me sick. Thing. Yeah, I know. And I think to set the scene to exactly where we were to go back to Daniel's point. So he started the farm in 16 and then 17, he was like, okay, I'm going to up it a little bit. So made that next step to up it. Right. But then that's when you started realizing like, oh, other florists, other event designers want this. Yeah, that was the first <clears throat> pivot of petal pickers was I was focused on just growing flowers and taking them to our own retail store. But then I realized, and I think I came and told you like, Wes, other people, like other businesses are trying to buy my flowers. <laughs> yeah. And so we were like, okay, so then... <laughs> But so between 17, when he realized that in 2020, when the shutdown happened, 2020 was the first like really, really, really big leap. Like you were like, I built from 17 to 20, I built roots. All of our customers were wanting the flowers. You've built this list of other retailers that want the flowers, the event, event designers. So that was the big spring, like. We have planned all my, yeah, everything was into this huge spring crop in 2020. Yeah, that's where it kind mm -hmm. of set things. And then the pandemic happened, the shutdowns happened, and we were immediately like, uh-oh, <laughs> what are we going to do? The good thing is for like furniture, home decor, yes, it's sitting there, but it doesn't expire. However, with cut flowers and houseplants, <laughs> they do kind of have a shelf life, you know? Yeah. I mean, houseplants continue to grow, but sitting in a retail store, and if no one's working, you know, someone's got to water them and right. that sort of thing. So we decided really quick within, I think it was like a two week period that just around the clock, we said, we're going to figure out how to ship our flowers and to keep people at the brick and mortar stores, you know, our employees employed, we're going to figure out how to ship the home decor products and gift items. Yeah. You know, we're not going to ship the huge stuff, but we can do this and then use our Instagram accounts to, you know, that'll be our tar target audience. And hopefully people locally can still support us too, but yeah. And so I've, I had been dabbling in selling online from our four rooms furniture store, literally out of the back room, which was the size of a closet, it maybe a like closet. a 10 by 10 room. So we would, we had been selling a little bit online for that store for, I think we started in 2019, the summer of 2019. Um, so we had about, I don't know, six or eight months <laughs> under our belt of dabbling in the online um, sales or whatever. Um, and we were like, had a basic understanding. And so when the shutdown happened, I was like, this is my only outlet. Like, I'm still going to be on Instagram. I can still decorate. I can still show products. So now how do we get it in the hands of the customers? And so that's when um, the nested fig, which is my online store that you were talking about, that's when it started. So that was the spinoff of it and it kind of took the elements from both of your retail stores and brought them together right um so you, you know you're shipping home decor but also a little bit of gardening stuff and yeah right and i used that opportunity i was like okay we had been selling just to my instagram following um from our retail store like i mentioned four rooms and the website was four rooms greenville and i felt like that was just kind of making us sound like a like if I'm wanting to reach an audience that's not in Greenville, South Carolina, and that you come across four yeah. rooms Greenville, it just sounds like a small, you know, um, who is that sort of thing. So that's when I was like, this needs to be its own business that I can brand as its own thing. And that's how that became its own Um the nested part. fig yeah so we were that's how it became the nested fig. And so then Daniel and I were literally working around the clock. We built a website. Building our own websites individually. <laughs> I was building petalpickers.com and Wes was nestedfig.com. And I'm like, hey, I need some kind of coding for this. Like, have you come across that yet? You know? Yeah. And I was, the shipping programs and the apps that wow. you can add to your website. And so we figured all that out. 
And I would say it's been pretty successful. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the best yeah. thing that happened. You know, sometimes the best things come from really bad stuff, right? right. You know, I mean. It goes back to you have to have that uncomfortable feeling and then, you know, working on it and uh, making it happen. And you can't be afraid to fail. You just have to, you know, try to focus on how you're going to figure it out. Right. And it's one bite at a time. And, okay, now I have the website. Okay. Now, right. How do we, where are we going to store all this? But, you know, we had the knowledge from building our retail stores for 11 years prior. So we knew how to get inventory. We already had employees, you know, it's like it all worked out, but it's because we had been building for 11 years, right? Uh, you know, and, and now for 13 years, it's didn't happen overnight. Not any of it. But, you know, would you not agree that there is just one thing that is through and through, and that is consistency? You got up and did it every day, right? right. I mean, right. I think that's where people get discouraged. I mean, that's kind of what I'm hoping that these talks that I'm doing with folks that are, you know, whether they started as a flower farmer and it led them somewhere else or flower farming is a part of what you're doing, like what you guys have built, that, I mean, it's not that we had, I mean, you already said you didn't have any money when you started, right. really. I mean, even the gifts you got, that's, that's, that's nothing compared oh. to what some people, right. I mean, I, I read on social media or people are saying, oh, you can't start a flower farm unless you have X, Y, Z and this and that. And I'm like, wow, I started with a wheelbarrow, some seeds and a shovel, literally, right. does that feel like a dinosaur or what? But I did it and I made money. So I could buy more stuff, you know, right. and I mean, I just want to encourage people that what we're talking about comes from being willing to be uncomfortable, to keep after and keep doing it. And I am a firm believer that the road to success is paved with failures. They're required. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Lisa. And it's never yeah. too late to start the business. Like if you've been to thinking change. about it, start today or change or whatever. And if you're like, how am I going to get there? How am I going to, like you said, you can take $500, yep. find what you can do with that and what you can sell. How can you make that $700? Then how can you make that $2,000 and you keep doing it and you feel like in the moment you are never going to get there but once you start the ball rolling it, it gets there and you can make it happen. You know when I first started um, the gardener's workshop the retail portion of our business in 2005 um, there was a local bird store you know where you go for wild bird stuff and everything and it was an independent store and I can remember one of the ladies that worked there lived on my street and she would stop here often to pick up stuff and I can remember her telling me the story of the lady that started that business like 30 years before and she said it's like you guys going to market and looking for the bar Organs. She said every week we would they would they would tally up how much they made, what they needed to pay their bills, and then what was left is what they could buy stock for for the next week. Right, and right. that's what they did to build this what turned into being an enormous franchise business for them. Um, you know, I mean, people talk about Apple being starting in somebody's garage, y'all. These are real stories. It's not right. that. You just have to be willing to do it. And I think the being vulnerable part is where people just think, oh, but I have this problem or that problem and they didn't have that or they have this or, you know, she has that. Not at all. I mean, we could fill up their ears with the problems, right? But right. we just faced them and figured it out. And you learn the most from your failures because, I mean, we've had so many. So, some examples, I guess, um, you know, I killed ranunculus for two years in a row and I spent some good money on trying to grow ranunculus, uh, maybe third time's a charm, but after killing it, I was determined to figure out how to grow it um, and really focused in, um, you know, I've killed trays and trays of transplant stuff that I've grown from seed. We've had the deer come in and eat 
a thousand sunflowers in one night. And believe it or not, I've seen a herd of 18 deer in my flower <laughs> field at one time. Um, and, and all that happens. So then, you know, okay, the deer ate my sunflowers. So we built a but, fence. But at the time before that, we couldn't afford to build the fence around the flower farm. So it was like, okay, well, then I just can't grow sunflowers right now. Yeah. Like don't spend the time focusing right. on sunflowers if I'm not going to be able to keep them out. So what can I plant that we can recoup that money? So that's what got mm -hmm. me into dahlias because deer don't eat dahlias. Yeah. And so that was, yeah, that's exactly, you take the situation and, and try to figure it out to something that works. Um, even it, uh, what's one failure that we've had? Oh, it roots. Um, you know, we always would try to beat our competition that we have an outdoor area at our plant store. And so we also have a Home Depot like two miles down the street. And we would always try to like Home Depot would get all these plants in early spring. And we're like, oh, we got to get our ferns in. We got to get our begonias in. And we would order everything in like one year we did it April 1st. Or the end of March. Or the end of We've March. We've done it all. Yeah. So then, well... <laughs> you think you're in the clear the weather looks good and then all of a sudden a 29 degree night is showing up for April 16th <laughs> and our frost dates ah. like the 15th and we have I don't I mean ten thousand dollars of annuals just sitting outside in our garden area and so like what do you do well we went and got a bunch of tarps frost cloth <laughs> and like we had our entire outdoor area tarped <laughs> I'm sure the neighbors down the neighborhood was like <laughs> What is going on? Cash bags, anything to cover it, you know, and some stuff didn't make it, but the most, most of it did. And it, we're always putting out fires like that. Um, but then you also learn, okay, was all of that worth it or was yeah. it not worth it? Was it worth it? Was it not worth it? So you know what now? A plant doesn't show up to about April 15th because I'm not going to live through that two weeks of stress <laughs> and move it. By the time I pay employees to tarp and untarp, haul in, haul out, the plants look beat up by then, it's not even yeah. worth it. So you just figure out like, okay, let's not do that. Yep. How are we going to make this simpler on us and everybody else? You're right. Well, I mean, I think it's sometimes you see other people doing it, like y'all saw Home Depot. I mean, that's what social media does to flower farmers. I just had a conversation yesterday on Clubhouse with our good friend Janice Harris of Harris Flower Farm in Canada, and we were interviewing her as a northern grower, and I said to her, so how do you watch all of us southerners with flowers and planting, and you're still weeks and weeks and weeks away and that's what I wanted to talk to her about because so many people that are inexperienced are going are doing what you were just talking about right. doing way early either they spent a ton of extra money it's like at the end of the day did you make more than you spent what is your gut feeling like you know I mean it's like I, I value things in gut juice right. I don't do anything that makes me crazy anymore you know I mean I've, I had my share of those things but yeah that's that's a really great point and so you know we've talked about the fears and the wins and the failures and so you know I call it fortitude it's like what feeds you well I can already tell that Wesley's the driving force um, yeah. because he was born with it I yeah. mean it's like me I'm a cliff jumper it's like I don't think about the costs perhaps before I think, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And then my team says, we just, we did it yesterday. Spent two hours talking about something at the end. I'm like, all right, let's not do it then. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're the, we're the rain makers and, um, but somebody else has to really figure out where the water's coming from. Right. I would like to add one thing though, back to what you were saying about the Instagram or whatever, that I feel like I see from the outside that flower farmers do a lot um, and that and going to social media and see what other people do is they want to grow things that just are not going to grow successfully for their area. You yeah. know, Daniel <laughs> was like, we need to grow roses. And I was like, 
you are not growing roses. See, this that's is where, where I put my foot down. That's like, where the horticulture degree came in good use because normally when I ask you about growing plants, he says, I don't know. Yeah, I'm like, you're never going to successfully grow a rose here in South Carolina with our humidity. It's never going to look better than what people can order in. When people want roses, they want this perfect rose. They want this. You That is a game you are never going to win or whatever. Right, right. Yes, out in, you know, Washington State California. or California, those places where they grow them successfully, they do look gorgeous on Instagram. But you're not going to do that here in South Carolina. It's not, it's just not going to work sort of thing. So I think you can't get caught up on social media and what other people are doing. Um, you know, it's so hard. Yeah, it's, it's so, so hard. hard. It's so hard. And I always tell, I think Daniel has a more of an issue with what I'm going to say than I do. But you got to, no matter what business you're in, flower farming, garden shop, home decor, you have to figure out your menu. Always compare it mm -hmm. to a restaurant. Like, what is your menu? You can't be an Italian restaurant and you're selling sushi. But you know what? Sushi's still good. That just doesn't mean that you're just not the one to sell that. I so think you have to, like, really narrow it down to your menu and do your menu really, really good. So that's what your customers are coming to you for. And I think that's taken me a lot of time to figure out what is my menu and what does grow well here. And I think, you know, as a starting off, you know, as a newer flower farmer, you're going to grow all you this gotta stuff. You got to dabble in You everything. have to like kill Experiment stuff. Experiment and cry. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think, I mean, this is my sixth year growing this season and my fifth year selling cut flowers. And I don't think I had my big revelation until over this past winter when I had time to stop and think and I said okay the business is really rolling but I have to stop growing everything and so I've kind of just narrowed it down and we'll continue <laughs> I still had some leftover seeds that I've germinated of course you had to try them I had to it was sitting there so I had to grow it um, but I've really started focusing and narrowing down my selection and and it you aren't going to know that year one unless you're just growing a single crop. Yeah, you, know? you have to cast with starting any business. A wide like net. A, yeah, cast a wide net, but immediately start working on narrowing it down. And that's the process to get you more streamlined and get you running like a smooth, you know, smooth machine. Like at Roots, we started out doing... Home Every decor, plants. Home decor, plants. I would do some weddings. I would do Christmas decorating. Because you were houses. hungry. Oh, right. Yeah. We when you're hungry, everything. you'll do anything. I mean, I did the crazy stuff too. But Daniel, I remember you saying, I don't remember if it was this last year or the year before when we were talking, that you were finding, you know, you're knocking some flowers out of the running because they don't ship well. That's become a big focus, right? And mm -hmm. There's just some things like these things that are behind me that you guys can see bachelor buttons and agristema. You wouldn't ship them, right? I mean, nope. <laughs> they would look like mush when they got there. And so it's always, I mean, nobody, all you have to do is call my sister and ask her how many times I change my direction. Right. You know, it's, it's got the big end goal, but there's all these little, gosh, rabbit holes, I guess, you can fall down and you need to fall in them every now and then, but you got to, to move really forward. I have had to go on blinders right. um, and, and get, and get help too. We, we've always just been open to change. Um, you have to be open to change, but we've always let our customers kind of guide us along the way, but not drive us. So like if one customer says, I have this huge wedding and I need yellow flowers and yellow is the Pantone color of the year and yellow, yellow, yellow. I can't make my whole crop plan yellow. That would be very bad. Right. <laughs> I've also always been told to grow flowers. If you're growing for event florists and weddings to grow flowers that are going to make the bride feel pretty on her special day. <laughs> yeah. So don't try to grow all these crazy things that are brown, that are whatever, they're always going to want white 
blush, right. <laughs> light pink They're that good. are pretty. So stick with your core or whatever. But yeah, you can't let, listen to your customers. Now, if, ever, if you're hearing over and over, oh, we need some more yellow. Do you have anything yellow? You right. hear yellow, yellow, yellow. Then maybe you should add some yellow to your um, crop. But it's, you can't let them drive you like what Daniel's saying is just because one person says, oh, you need to be doing this because right. if you start listening to everybody, you, again, your menu gets too big. You're all over the place. You're doing this, you're doing that. And you mm -hmm. lose focus of what your main core is. It's true. And I do, I'm a firm believer in networking and networking it means more than one or two people right. um, because you can definitely fall into something like that. If you're, I mean, whether it's a customer or a cohort, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. totally. And it's, and it's one of those things like just because another flower farm or retail store or whatever in your area is doing something doesn't mean that you then have to do it. Like, let them do that. Let them, like, find your path. Let them do their path. Stay right. in your lane. Doesn't mean, you know, if someone's growing roses, everyone has to grow roses. Someone's going to do it really good. Let them be the rose person or the rose people. There's going to be more than one. But, you know, um, right. but remember what you do best in you, like you said, you got to put blinders on and you learn to do that after a while, but it takes a long time to put those blinders on because you feel like you're missing out and you feel it's like evolution yeah. and it's, there's many steps to that process. But. Yeah. And crop selection is a big one of those, isn't it, Daniel? It's like mm -hmm. people say to me all the time, like, we're, you know, we're getting ready to have an open farm here and people can say, well, why aren't you growing this or growing that? It's like, they're all great but I don't need to grow all of them. It doesn't mean I will never grow them. It just means at this point in time, right? Like you said, when, when you couldn't keep the deer out, you learned what you couldn't grow because they didn't eat these other things. And then I'm sure you brought sunflowers back. I know I saw them on your social feed, not long ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the deer you know, holding strong. So <laughs> lots yeah. of flowers this year. So things are always changing and it doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. And, um, so, you know, you've been sharing these tips just throughout our talk here. And, um, you know, my, the way that y'all did it is very much what I had written down here is starting small, taking small bites and trying to set yourself up for success. For instance, you guys doing your market shopping um, would be the way, like if you were a flower farmer, I'd say a way for a flower farmer to set their self up for success is that if you don't have a cooler, don't grow tulips. Right. Just go to social media today, and I'm sure you can find 10 suffering growers that don't have anywhere to sell their tulips because they're first years and they don't have a cooler to keep them in. Um, that's not setting yourself up for success. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's. that's yeah, and time. that goes back to working with, you know, what you have. If you can't afford a cooler at the moment. Yep. That is important to tulips as we all know, then don't grow the tulips because you're not- There's plenty of other stuff to grow. Right. Good grief. That's what I lived on, right? right. I mean, and you yeah. You have to start looking ahead though. And so last winter, I built two additional coolers. So the opposite, right. because I knew what was coming down the line and I wanted tulips to be a big crop for our business. I didn't need the third cooler yet, but because I was building one, I thought I'm going to go in and build the other. And sure enough, this spring, all three were full. <laughs> and really? I, you know, how did I, I just think like, what, what made me build that third cooler? Like, I really didn't know, but I just felt like this is going to be a bigger thing and I'm going to need this in the future. It's easier to do it now than it will be to stop everything and start this project again later. So it's kind of, you know, you have your intuitions. I was going to say intuition and experience. And, you know, we do learn as we go through this. And I mean, the forecast in the flower world is pretty good looking for the next, you know, I mean, I live in five year lumps. Right. And um, yeah, it's just getting better and better. And, um, you know, I just appreciate y'all taking the time. I know both of you, it's the week before the week of Mother's Day. So I know Daniel has better things to be doing. And I know you probably do too, Wes. Um, but I just, 
have so much admiration for the businesses that you guys have built. And um, for those of us on social media, you know, flowers are just such an amazing part of that. And, you know, I just love sharing with people, first off, um, for me being the old woman in the group, you know, many of my grower friends, I'm 61 now. When I started hitting in my early 50s, I thought, you know, I don't think I can do this till I'm 70. I love it, but it's right. pretty hard. Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to like highlight some of the amazing paths that people have brought to flower farming or taken from there. And y'all were at the top of my list um, with these amazing businesses. So now I want you to share how people can connect with you all, how they can watch your shop and show Wes and how they can order your flowers, Daniel. Y'all, um, you just, everybody deserves to get a bouquet in the mail. Daniel has shipped me several bouquets and they are all breathtakingly beautiful. Um, and you will not be sorry. Um, so fill us in. How can people okay. you can buy from you? All right, before we get to how you can connect with us, I have one last tip that I always share with <laughs> business owners that I talk to. And that is when you're thinking about your fears, going back to fears, don't focus on the fear of failing. What you really need to focus on is if you succeed, because if you succeed, it is much, much harder <laughs> than if you fail. Because it's you true. Don't fall. You will hit a wall at some point in your adventure when you realize this is working. And not only is this working, now this is a marathon that I have to keep up with for the next however many years my career is going to be. Which is everything you asked for. Which is everything you exactly. asked for. But getting through that wall when you realize you know, you start out with that mental underlying subconscious of, is this going to work? Am I making it? It doesn't feel like I'm making it. I'm never going to really make it. And then it slowly turns to like, oh, this is working. It's going to work. It is working. Then you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, it's working. And I've <laughs> got to keep this going. Like that is, that was much harder for me to break through than thinking about the the failing part of it. So you got to mentally prepare yourself to run the marathon for years and years and years. I mean, and that's the talk everybody talks about, about being sustainable. Well, that sustainability can be you and to keep your brain power. I know for me, it's like keeping ahead of the monster is a lot of energy. And yeah, right. I totally agree with that, Wesley. That was a great, that's a great one. That's a great one. So you can find me on Instagram at farm shenanigans. You can follow me here at our farm and I do decorating things and that sort of thing. And then for our online store, it's called the nested fig. And we do have an app that you can download and shop. And it's just, if you search the nested fig in any app store on your iPhone or Android phone or whatever. And you can find our store there and see what we sell that we ship nationwide. And then Daniel, you can find him. I'm at Pedal Pickers on Instagram, or you can go to pedalpickers.com is our retail website. And you can ship anyone that you love. Or we actually, I actually have a lot of flower farmers that'll buy my flowers that live up in the north. And they'll buy my early spring flowers just because they want to have flowers again while they still have snow on the ground. Um, but you awesome. Can, yeah, but you can order at petalpickers.com. Um, and we have, as long as the flowers are blooming, uh, we're shipping them. And we kind of do a bouquet each week. And it just depends on what's blooming out in the field. And you're going to get the best of what we have out there. That is so awesome. Y'all are just such an inspiration in so many ways. And I appreciate you being here with us today. Thank and so my you. friends, if you're enjoying this podcast, we always love it when you share it with your friends, give a review, please connect with Daniel and Wes through their social apps. Um, I'm sorry, social media. Um, I'll actually put the links in the show notes below this podcast. Um, and I will tell you that they have a miniature donkey. Is it a miniature or is it just a donkey? It's a miniature Romeo. Romeo. And what's the big bird you have? We have emus now. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Y'all, you just have to, for if no other reason, to see these guys and to hear Romeo just makes me smile. <laughs> so friends, um, if you want to learn more about the work we're doing at the Gardener's Workshop, you can just head over to the gardenersworkshop.com. We're an online garden store, um, virtual learning center. We have online courses and schools. You want to build a business based on flowers? We are here for you. And, um, you know, Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Wes, for being thank here. Thank you for having us. Thank and, you for um, everything, Lisa. Appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you guys, too. So until we meet again, friends, ciao.